Everybody's quiet. Welcome to church this morning. Glad you're here. Appreciate you being in the service with us today. If you're watching online, thank you also for tuning in with us. And if you're downstairs in the overflow room, thank you so much. I'm going to do something a little bit different than before. I'll do announcements now, and then after the announcements, I'll give us our morning verse. No choir tonight. If you're a choir member, no choir tonight. We'll be back next uh, Sunday. And also know our orchestra uh, tonight, too, at 6.30. Uh, it's church. Pastor will bring, bring a message tonight about how the world's going to end tomorrow. <laughs> I, had to, I had to say that. But no, he's bringing a message tonight about something. And then uh, um, Wednesday, Juana, back in service. We'll be having Juana at 645 and prayer meeting in here at 7 o'clock. And you see in your bulletin, too, on April 20th, a Hawaiian theme that the teens are going to have for if you're more mature in life. Uh, they would like us, or I'm not mature, so uh, <laughs> like, not for me, but you can sign up out here. It's a Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. And uh, they'll be doing something for us that are retired and empty nesters and just senior citizens. So thank you. Deacons, after the morning service, we have a meeting. Please remember that today. Now, let me give you the verse for this week. Psalms 91.5.1. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. So let's be sure and do that. We're going to sing. Take your hymn book, please, if you care to use it. It's 111. 111. The, the amazement of Christ dying for us and rising again uh, impressed so much upon the hearts of many of the hymn writers, including Charles Wesley. Amazing, amazing love. And can it be?
an eclipse tomorrow. Well, might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in. You know what? Um, when Christ was crucified, there was darkness. And it wasn't an eclipse. It was a miraculous darkness over the land. God would not permit human beings to gape at Jesus during that time he was suffering for our sins. Well might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in together. Well might the sun missionary was telling about he was ministering in an area where people did not have much at all and the offering plate came by and this man had no money to put in it and so he put the offering plate on the floor and stepped into it. Dear Lord, I give myself my all. Tis all that I can do. What a wonderful illustration of total dedication to the Lord. Todd's going to lead us in prayer this morning, um, and uh, we have a number of requests. Our, one of our missionaries, Jonathan Washer, he has a ministry, uh, mostly in prisons. He goes in and has basketball camps and all that kind of thing, and uh, he's experiencing some really wonderful uh, opportunities in various states. A lot of the prisons closed up at COVID, and now they're opening back up again, and they're wanting them to come back again and again uh, because they like even they, they like what he does for the prisoners. He goes in there and he preaches the gospel, and folks get saved. And uh, they have a summer basketball program. And by the way, they are they use members of local churches to go in and help with this. And so they still need two more guys, two or three more guys to travel with them in, uh, from June 4 to 7 as they play basketball against inmates in the Kentucky prison. So if you're a basketball, I wouldn't do any good for me. But if you're a basketball player and you're interested in that, and uh, well, you might want to contact them. They're looking for a few more people. And uh, Troy and Oksana Manning, they are with Bibles International. Uh, they are in the ministry of translating scriptures. I mean, we have, how many Bibles do you have in your home? How many do you have on your phone? How many, but in many places that's not the case. Here are some testimonies of some people that have received Bibles in their own language. There are three of these just from India. Here's one, of all the gifts I've received, the Bible stands out as the most precious. It has lightened the burdens of my life. And this is, these are refugees who have, running from, from persecution. Here's another one. Daily I weep due to the persecution and hardships I endure. However, receiving the New Testament in this language, my two language, brought me peace and assurance of my salvation. Here's another one from India as well. I, now, I am now able to express my gratitude to the Lord for his blessings, particularly for the gift of the Bible, which I cherish more than physical sustenance. Here's a refugee from China. 
fleeing China because of the Civil War, I worked, fleeing to China because of the Civil War, I worked as a home maid with tears as my constant companion. Receiving the Falam Chin Bible was transformative. Reading it daily has given me peace, reassurance of my salvation, and has helped me overcome depression. Here's another one from Thailand, another refugee. This Falam Chin Bible, which I came across by chance, has changed my life. I have found true peace within and am thankful to God for the salvation offered through Jesus Christ. This profound truth was revealed to me through the pages of this Falam Chin Bible. God is using their ministry around the world of Bibles International, and we support these folks on a regular basis. We're so thankful that we can pray for them and support them in ministry. I have a few folks with uh, physical concerns. Pam Smucker's in rehabilitation. Keith Hoffman is going to have heart cath on Wednesday. Don Casper is going to have a biopsy on Tuesday. And so let's pray for these folks. And then we, we pray always for our leaders in our country in election year, our military and, and the law enforcement, fire medical folks as well. Uh, they need our prayers. And in our world, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on that seems to be expanding and getting worse with Iran. And uh, so we just need to ask God to have mercy upon us, help us to be the type of Christians we need to be in this world atmosphere and right here in our own country, in our own towns, in our own neighborhoods. Todd, please come and lead us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the goodness that you show us each day, the grace that you show us, the mercy that you've given to us, and forgiveness. God, I ask that you would help us to be humble servants. Lord, we think of uh, the situation that we find ourselves in uh, here in the world with Iran and Israel and, and where we stand as a nation. Lord, I ask that you would help us to humble ourselves, Lord, that uh, we would come alongside Israel. Uh, Lord, I ask that you would continue to guide and direct there uh, with all the atrocities. Lord, I ask that you would uh, just enable the soldiers uh, there to do uh, what you've gifted them to do. Lord, I ask that you would be with us as a nation, Lord, that we would uh, repent of our sin. Uh, Lord, as leaders, that we would uh, seek your face. Lord, just ask that you would uh, be with us this year, especially as we think of the election coming up. Uh, Lord, just ask, also ask that you be with those that are uh, just continuing to, to uh, as Christians, Lord, that we need to uh, shine the light, Lord, that we need to be a bold witness, Lord, that we need to, to put you first. And God, I ask that as a nation that we would repent and turn around. Lord, just ask that you be with those in law enforcement and first responders and and uh, lord says that you be with those on the uh in the fire lord says give them strength give them grace for each day help them lord as they uh are ministering in the way that you have enabled them lord says that you would help them as they face these things uh lord that they can find their strength in you uh, lord says that you would help them and give them words of wisdom as they uh are on the front lines, Lord, I ask that you would give them the strength that they need each day. Lord, I ask that you would uh, be with Jonathan Washer and the ministry that he has there. We're thankful for just the, the testimony that he has. And Lord, that he has the, the ability to go in and minister and effectively preach the gospel to, to all the inmates. And Lord, I ask that you would be with them as, as he continues to share the message. Lord, that souls would uh, get saved. Lord, that uh, those that don't know you as a personal Savior would, would hear of uh, your love for them, would hear the truth, and Lord, that they would uh, give their lives to you. Lord, I ask that you would enable him and uh, uh, those that, that, are, that help out with that basketball ministry. Uh, thank, thankful for and that ministry that you've given to him. And Lord, we also think of uh, the Mannings. Uh, we're so uh, excited with uh, Bibles International that they're able to uh, 
uh, effectively uh, print off more Bibles and, and they have some more Bibles nearing completion and we're so thankful for that. Lord, we're, we're so privileged here. Um, help us, Lord, to hold your word dear to our hearts. Uh, we have so much that we can easily uh, let that not be effective. And Lord, these people are, are thronging just to know that they have a Bible that might be coming. Lord, it's asked that you would help us to hold dear the word, hide it in our hearts, and Lord, that we would seek to, seek to know you better each day. Lord, we also think of those uh, with physical concerns. Lord, it's asked that you would be with them. Lord, we ask that you might be with Pam Schmucker and pray for her. Uh, she's in rehab and also Keith Hoffman is he's going to have a heart cath. Lord, it's asked that you would be with the doctors, give them wisdom and steady hands. Uh, Lord, it's asked that you would also be with Dawn Casper. She's got a biopsy on Tuesday. Lord, that uh, you would guide and direct there. But we thank you again for uh, all that you've given to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. You've noticed that uh, this is Communion Sunday. I always make this announcement regarding that. Um, um, if you know the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior, you are invited to partake with us. Uh, you don't have to be a member. This, I've always said that, that uh, or for many years I've said, this is the Lord's table, it's not ours. And so if you, if you know the Lord as Savior, you're welcome to partake. If, you, if you're walking in the light the best you can and, and you're not under the just discipline of any other uh, biblical church, we, we invite you to partake. By the way, if you are a visitor with us, please take one of these visitor cards that you can find in front of you in the pew and fill it out and give it to me or Todd or Randy um, after the service. We'd love to have a record of your being here. In preparation for our communion time, let's, let's take our hymn book and turn to number 380, or you can use the, the screen, 380. It's a wonderful hymn about our sure assurance of salvation in the Lord Jesus himself. On Christ I stand. Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 26. Is my ticker up there, my little changer? Nope, it's here. I've got it. Thank you. I'm going to use this somewhat this morning. 
Matthew chapter 26, we're going to read in just a moment. Uh, back in, way in the 1500s, King Edward, King of England, uh, when he died, right before he died, he said this, he prayed, he said, O oh Lord God, defend this realm from the papistry, papistry, and, and maintain thy true religion. He was concerned about uh, the, the Roman church having influence in England. Well, he was succeeded by a lady named Mary. Some of you may know of her. His older sister succeeded him in, in the throne, and she was a rigid, very strong uh, Roman Catholic. She restored the mass. She called, uh, called, uh, canceled the English service. She had the works of, of the reformers, Luther, Zwingli, Calvin, and uh, Tyndale. She had those uh, documents burned, but not only did she burn the documents, she had some of those uh, people who were standing for what those documents said burned alive as well. John Rogers was one of them. He was executed on February 4, 1555. The authorities came, got him out of bed, hardly gave him time to dress, led him out to the place of execution. They marched him down the street uh, where his, his, some of his church people could even see him. He was a pastor. And uh, on his way, he saw his wife and ten, 10 children. They barely had time to even say goodbye to him. And uh, he, he was burned at the stake, as was a fellow by the name of, of John Cooper. He suffered agony. They, the people that were lighting the fires kept messing it up, and it took him 45 minutes to die. And there were others, many of them. Matter of fact, there were under, under uh, they call her Bloody, Bloody Mary, under Bloody Mary's rule and reign, there were 288 believers burned at the stake. Now, what was the issue? In every case, in every case, it had to do with communion. Every single one. And it had to do with an understanding of this verse that is in, on me in Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 28, it says, as they were eating, this is in, in, in the last supper, the last Passover service, first communion, Jesus took bread, blessed it, break it, gave to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. He took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. All of the martyrdom that took place had to do with a misunderstanding of this verse. Because the Roman church was teaching in the doctrine, teaching the doctrine of transubstantiation. That means that the elements, the, the bread and the wine or juice uh, would actually become the body and the blood of Christ. Uh, another guy that was martyred, John Rogers, he said, I was asked whether I believed in the sacrament, that is communion, uh, that the body and blood of a savior was actually physically present. And I said, no, that's false. They murdered him, they martyred him. Same true with Roland Taylor. He, uh, he denied transubstantiation. Uh, and they just, and it was all over this issue of whether or not when we have communion, the body and, 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 and blood of Jesus is actually present in the communion service. And what, what you know, is that an issue today? Well, it was, an, it was certainly an issue back then. Uh, the, the Roman church had what they called the Council of Trent. They met several times to decide on this subject. And uh, they clearly stated in the Council of Trent that w when communion happens, the Eucharist, uh, the, the, the body of the substance, the bread, actually becomes the body of Christ. And then the blood, the, the juice, the wine, actually becomes the blood of Christ. And when it's held up and, and honored, then Christ is re-sacrificed there now, that doctrine of the Roman church uh, hasn't changed. As a matter of fact, in um, 
the Second Vatican Council back in the 60s, uh, they, they reaffirmed this, and then the present day Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1992, they haven't changed it either, so it's still there. However, interesting, uh, a lot of individual Roman Catholics today, I read an interesting article, they don't believe in transubstantiation. They don't believe that anymore. Matter of fact, 39%, according to this uh, article, say they don't believe that anymore. And, and a large majority of that 39% are older people, more traditional people. So what, what that means is that 50, 60% of, according to this article of Roman Catholics, do not believe that doctrine anymore. Interesting. Now, they're rejecting the doctrine, but it may not be because they are becoming Protestants. It may be because they are the, these are the same people that are also rejecting other doctrines of the Roman church that happen to be biblical doctrines like the sacredness of marriage and uh, the sinfulness of, of, of fornication or the sinfulness of homosexuality. Because a, a lot of, you know, even in the church, they're tossing out these things. And along with that, they've tossed out uh, the transubstantiation. Uh, so these people that don't believe it anymore, they might not be becoming born-again Christians. I hope that they are. I hope that they are coming to know the Lord Jesus as Savior and putting their trust in Jesus alone for salvation. Uh, you can say, well, can you be in the Roman church and, and be a Christian? Well, if you are trusting in Christ as, as your Savior, yes, you can be a Christian and you can be on your way to heaven, but not because of the church, but in spite of the church. Just like many Baptists can be saved uh, not because of the church, but in spite of the church's Baptist and otherwise, a lot of the major uh, denominations today are rejecting Christ as Savior altogether. But there are some older people, particularly in these fellowships that, if you can call them fellowships, that st are born again Christians. So they're, they're live chicks under a dead hen is what it amounts to. And, and, and it's sad, and, and many of them don't have the discernment or whatever to get out. Uh, it would be wonderful if a lot of these people have really come to know the Lord as Savior, uh, but they remain in the church. But, you know, who cares about whether or not? I mean, it's, it, well, I tell you, all those guys that got burned to the stake, they cared, as did Bloody Mary. She cared. She cared. It was very important. Why? What is, the, what is your understanding of communion can affect your life? I want to talk about that this morning. Who was Jesus and where is he now? I want to answer that question. Who was Jesus and where is he now? Well, Jesus is and was the eternal son of God. Before he came to this earth, he always existed with the Father and the Holy Spirit. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's who Jesus was. So before creation, where was the Son of God? He was with the Father and the Holy Spirit in heaven. Where did Jesus go after he rose from the dead? Well, he went to heaven to be again with the Father and the Holy Spirit. In heaven. What does it say? What did Jesus say to the disciples? He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you, okay? And I will come again, but, right, but I'm going to be up there. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Uh, the apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, and he said, God was manifest in the flesh. That's when J the Son of God became human. Jesus was his name. And, but then he was received up into glory. So who is Jesus and where is he now? Jesus was fully human at the time of conception. He didn't cease to be God, uh, but he limited himself, not utilizing all the benefits, if we can call it that, of being God. One of those benefits was his omnipresence. Jesus in his humanity could only be in one place at a time. There's nothing in the Bible that speaks about Jesus Christ 
being physically here now, whether it's in communion or whether it's in any other time. There's nothing in the Bible. There's plenty in the Bible about Jesus being with us, of course. Where two or three are gathered together, I'm, I'm in the midst, Jesus said. He said, go into all the world, preach the gospel. I will be with you always. So the issue is not the presence of the Lord Jesus. The issue is what kind of presence that is. Why is that important? Where are you going with this, Pastor? Well, keep on listening and I'll tell you. All right? Tune in. Put on your little doctrinal caps. It's good for us to understand what the Bible says. Where must you go to have your sins forgiven? If you believe that you must come through a human priest and come to communion, you have a problem with your access to God because you have a go-between. Somebody between you and God, in the case of the Roman church, a, a church and a priest. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says in 1 Timothy 2, 5, there is one God and one mediator between God and men. Who is that? The man, Christ Jesus. You know, the, the book of Hebrews talks, explains the Old Testament priesthood and all that sort of thing. And it says that all those priests, all the sacrifices they did, it says every priest stood daily offering offerings again and again and again and those are they could never take away sin they could cover sin and they prefigured the one sacrifice that Jesus would make someday but they could not cover but the priest over and over and over again over again would they do that but what does the Bible say about Jesus the Bible says about Jesus but this man after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever he sat down at the right hand of God the Father he sat down. What did it say about the other priests? They stand daily in the temple. What does it say about Jesus? When he died and rose again, he went to the Father and he sat down. Finished work of Christ. No more sacrifices. No more. No more. So, the all right, here's the point. Who is the one who connects you to God? Who is he and where is he? Is he on the communion table? Not at all. Jesus is physically in heaven at the right hand of God, and he actually, he is interceding for you. Romans chapter 8, verse 34, who is he that condemns? It's Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again. He is, where is he? He is at the right hand of God. What is he doing? He is interceding for you. It has to do with your assurance. Five bleeding wounds he bears received on Calvary. They pour effectual prayers. They strongly plead for me. Forgive him. Oh, forgive, they cry, nor let that ransom sinner die. Jesus is physically in heaven interceding for you and for me. There are no more substitutionary sacrifices being made on any altar today that are in any way efficacious that means they they don't do any good if they're there so back in the old testament uh, they had the tabernacle when they wandered around in the desert for 40 years and then they built the temple when they got to jerusalem and both of those places the, the tabernacle in, in, in the old testament that were called the tent of meeting particularly the, the place uh, where the priests spent a lot of time and, and, and uh, in that tent of meeting, whether it would be the portable church they had in the wilderness or in the temple, there was, there was this uh, two rooms, actually, two rooms. There was the holy place, and then there was the holiest, okay? The holy place was where the altar of incense was, and there was a menorah there, and there was a table of showbread, and, and uh, but then... In the holiest, another room, that's where the Ark of the Covenant was resting. And that's where once a year a priest would come in and he would sprinkle the blood from a, a sacrifice on the altar of, of, of 
the sacrifice there, the, the, the covenant. Between those two rooms was a very thick curtain. Only once a year could one priest go past that curtain into the holies, the holiest place, because it was, it was uh, uh, the very manifest presence of God was there. And so that holy place, the holiest, that thick curtain separated those two. You see, folks back then and many folks today believe that God is, I hate to use this word because it's so well overused, it's terrible. God is awesome. God is holy. God is almighty. He is holy. He is beyond. He is magnificent. He is fearful. And back then and today, people who understand that have misgivings about approaching him. And so that's why God was teaching that he was holy. And he was teaching that without blood, there's no remission of sins. He was teaching all that through all the Old Testament sacrifices. And then he fulfilled all of those in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, one of the last things that he said was, it is finished. It is finished. You're Salvation is completely and fully paid for. All of the sacrifices that were made beforehand, this is their completion, this is it. And when Jesus died, what happened? What happened? Read that verse. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice hanging on the cross, yielded up the ghost, he died, and behold, what happened to that veil in the temple? The, the, the veil was torn in two, from the top to the bottom, and the earth quaked. The veil that separated, that kept all other priests except one and that one priest once a year from going into the very manifest presence of God, that when Jesus died in Jerusalem, that veil was torn from the top to the bottom. Now what, what is that miraculous event? What, what is the significance of that? God tore that veil when Jesus died to indicate to us that no longer was the presence of God linked to any human structure or building. The Old Testament priesthood was over with. There were no longer priests that needed to represent people. No one on earth would ever again be allowed to be the mediator between God and people. Now people who believed in Christ could come directly to God through their high priest, the Lord Jesus. And it was torn from the top to the bottom, not from the bottom to the top, indicating that salvation is from God. It's not from us, how we work for it. All of those things. And so how does the Bible then apply this? Well, the book of Hebrews says, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest. Remember the two rooms, the holy place and then the holiest? We have boldness now to enter into the holiest. How? By the blood of Jesus by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil. That is to say, his flesh. How does that affect us today? Every individual who is a born-again Christian has direct access to God without any kind of church mediation of any kind. If you believe that you need to be in church and have communion to have your sins forgiven, you're, you're, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. Uh, you don't need church to, to be saved. You don't need communi uh, communion to be saved. Now, so what are we having it for then? Well, glad you asked. Okay? Listen, it would be really handy for me to say to you, uh, you need me. You need me because I am your access to God. Okay, I am your priest. If I did that, I would be claiming for myself authority that I don't have, and I would, I would be causing you to attend church out of fear that you might not make it to heaven so you'd have to come and you'd have to avail yourself of my services. Think about that for just a minute. For salvation, you would have to, you'd need to show up for communion. 
why do I encourage people to come to church? I don't do it so that you can have access to God through me. I encourage you to come to church and take communion because God wants us to celebrate together the wonderful truth of our full access to him apart from any man other than the Lord Jesus himself. Our church attendance is a thanksgiving offering that we make along many other uh, expressions of thanksgiving. Church attendance and communion and these things, they're not, remember, some of you remember this. Maybe they've got it back now, I don't know. Remember the department stores, you could go in and you wanted to buy this new coat and you didn't have enough, enough money and so they, you put it on layaway. How many of you remember layaway? Okay. Not talking about burying somebody now, that's a whole different <laughs> layaway. But you, you, you didn't have enough money, so you'd go in, you'd put some money. So they'd take that coat and they'd put it aside. You'd lay it away and then you'd come back next week when you got your check and you'd pay a little more and then finally you could get, finally you could get uh, your coat that you want. Listen. Salvation is not on the layaway plan, and you come and make payments to church. It's not what that is. You don't come to church to gain access to God. You come to church to have access to other Christian people. Huh? Yeah. I thought coming to church, you just come sit there and listen for a while, and then you go home. I know, that's sad. A lot of people do that. Or they just stay at home and watch it on the, on the web. You come to church to gain access to other believers for fellowship and encouragement so that the gifts that other people have, they can use them to encourage you in your Christian faith. And the gifts that you have, you can encourage them and build them up in their faith. Pastors are not mini-popes. We are under shepherds. We are here to feed the flock and to protect the flock. We are shepherds, not mediators. You are not second class citizens of heaven because you're not pastor. We are equal. The ground is level at the cross. We all have the same access to almighty God through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is interesting. Read this. Ye also as living stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness. Who wrote that? Who wrote that? Who was the person that God used to give that part of inspired scripture? Who was that? He wasn't the first pope. He was, and he was not, this is not a pastoral epistle. This is a general epistle. He wasn't writing to Timothy or Titus. He was writing to people in the pews, if we could call it that. You are priests, just as the one priest once a year could get into the holiest. You are a priest. You have access to that. You are privileged beyond what we could imagine. What does that do for you? That means that if you come to communion or church and you have a great, hear a great message or a wonderful song that inspires your heart and all that, when you leave, you are just as close to God when you get in your car and head for the restaurant as you were when you were here. The manifest presence of God, the, the, he is always here. You're not far from God when you're away from church. What does that do for us? Well, you know, for most of us, this stuff, well, we know that, we know that. We, yeah, but a lot of people don't. That's why even born-again Christian people, they somehow feel like church is a special place where I can get close to God. Church is a great place to get close to Christian people. God designed it that way so that you can fellowship with one another and spend time with one another and plan other things with one another. 
It's, we are a body. And church is one of the places that that body operates quite well, and that's why God set it up for the whole church age, from Pentecost to the rapture. Having assurance of salvation is not in communion. It is in the Lord Jesus Christ, in Christ alone. Your righteousness, the righteousness that you need for heaven is not on the communion table. He is at the right hand of God. And he is interceding for you. You are just as close to the Lord when you leave today and tomorrow when you go to school or work or whatever you do, you're just as close to him as you are. Remember that lady, the Samaritan lady, Jesus was in Samaria and uh, he was witnessing to her and he got down pretty close to what her sin was and she kind of changed the subject and and she said, well, our fathers worshiped here up in Samaria. We did this. And you guys say, you guys say it's down in Jerusalem at the temple. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said there's going to come a day when we will neither place, in other words, and it was soon, no longer will God's presence and blessing be associated with a building or an, a location. They that worship him will worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, having said all that, have I dissed communion? This is a word, a new word that I learned some time ago. <laughs> they dissed me. They dissed me. I don't know what it, well, I know what it means, but I don't, I wouldn't want to do an etymology on it to figure out everything. Uh, have I put, no, no. Have, have what I said about communion now minimized its importance? Or the importance of church? Absolutely not. Oh, my goodness. What did the early church do? It says daily, daily, they met and they worshiped joyfully together, daily. Some people, well, I just go to church once a week. Well, fine, I'm glad you're here. Avail yourselves of, of, other, of God's people here, that's good. Uh, you get more availing if you come on Sunday night and you get more yet on Wednesday. You know, so, so that, that's a side commercial here. I'm not, I'm not chewing you out. Church is like a restaurant. If you're hungry, you're going to show up. Okay? So I'm not minimizing the ministry of a local church. Not at all. And I'm not minimizing communion at all. As a matter of fact, communion is so important that if you partake unworthily, you bring chastisement upon yourself. God will spank you. According to 1 Corinthians 11. And so that's why he says, the apostle uh, Paul told the people at Corinth, let a man examine himself before he partakes of communion. Let him examine himself. You know, there's some churches, they're very serious about this thing, communion. Maybe some of you come from some of these backgrounds, I don't know, but uh, you, you have to go to an elder and he examines you before you get to partake of communion. And he can say yes or no. Interesting. How would you like it if I said, all right, let's line up every you know, Okay, yes, no, yes, no. Yeah, okay, you guys, you can't do it. How would you? The scriptures say, let a man examine himself. Now, I applaud the seriousness of people who want to make sure that they're giving communion to folks that are deserving. None of us is deserving. Those that are, are, are right with God as best we can through the blood of Christ. Uh, I applaud that, but the Bible says he examine a man examine himself, not somebody else. And so that's what we that's why we're here. This is some churches do this every week, some do it once a month, some do it, you know, three, four times a year, like we do. Jesus didn't say how many times. He said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. That's the point. And so Bottom line for us is this. If you believe in the holiness and almightiness of God, and that really impresses your heart, you're going to also be impressed with the fact that you can bow your head and say, Oh, Father, and you come right into his manifest presence, just like the one priest did once a year. You have access to him.
the result of that, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we don't have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He was in all points tempted like as we are and yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace and find grace and help in time of need. Come boldly through the veil to the very presence of God Almighty, a dirty sinner like you and me. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for these truths. Thank you for the fact that all who are trusting in the blood of Jesus Christ alone for salvation are born-again Christians saved forever. Even the ones that are live chicks under dead hens. Thank you for that. Help us to be a light to those who don't understand these things and help us to rest and rejoice in these truths. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I'll ask the deacons if you'll come now and uh, we're gonna sing together. It'll be on the screen for you. Uh, uh, Marvelous grace of our loving Lord marvelous grace of our loving Lord. By the way, just to remind you that when you pick the cup, there's, 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 there's still two together, correct? Are we right? Okay. There are two. There's one right on top of the other one, okay? One has the bread, the other has the juice, okay? So be sure to get both of them, and then we'll partake together at the right time. Grace greater than all our sin.
there somebody would like to give a testimony? Do we have a rolling <coughs> microphone someplace? Got one down here. Is there a microphone? May not. Stand up and speak up, please. It's kind of hard for me to start this one because there's a lot to it. So I Don't take too long now. I'll try not to. <laughs> <laughs> when I was younger, my mother, uh, I, there was like a year that my mother would, uh, a service would be laid on her heart as well as a person. And she would do a service for that person. And that person often would be, when they received it, oh, how can I thank you? I can't thank you enough. And God gave her a verse. It's Matthew uh, 10, verse 42. This is at the end of when uh, God, or Christ, had sent out the disciples. He told them, some people will reject you, kick off, your, kick off the dirt off your feet. Others will accept you. And he said, at the very end of that, he says, even a cup of cold water given in my name will not lose its reward. God will not forget to give a reward to those who are doing it. And so her answer was basically, don't worry about thanking me. God will take care of it. I'm doing this for God. I'm going to relay with you a little bit about cups of cold water. Some of you may wonder what it's like to have a big family like I have. <laughs> And I will tell you that after this last week with a lot of rain, some night, times at night, we are trying to settle the kids down. I had one on each leg. I had one beside me, one on the other side of me. I looked over at Tiffany and I said, if you've ever wondered what it was like to be a pot cooking popcorn, I know what it's like now. <laughs> but also with a big family, you know, that whole thing about paying it forward and people talk about, somebody paying for the car behind them in the drive through Well, if you're in a family like mine, you drive up with kind of a, it's been mistaken as the new church bus a time or two. <laughs> <laughs> and we're sitting there still ordering when usually the people in front of us are receiving their food and driving away. I don't really expect that. And it was really surprising one time when we were headed over to uh, Pennsylvania for my wife's uh, my, uh, grandmother passing away. We were at a stop, rest stop, one of those that's kind of like, has a lot of things going on in it. And uh, she was taking care of Dane like only mothers can do. And I was taking care of the rambunctious kids. We, I had them running out the sidewalk, running around, and I call up, hey, can you find out if your mother and if your mom and dad are planning for dinner with us or not, blah, 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 making these types of arrangements. And finally, we decide that we're going to eat there. And I'm discussing with my kids what, what they voted on, and they voted on pizza. We walk out there, and I make the order, and the guy says, well, we have two pizzas coming out right now. Is that good for you? And I was like, well, yeah, that's good for them, but I wanted a couple others. And so he gave some to me. And I go to pay the bill, and lo and behold, somebody had already paid. <laughs> that was kind of a shock to me. But I'm going to share this with you because I need to remind my family, and some of you guys have been a part of this, okay? A couple months ago, we had our devotions where it talked about God's ways are not my ways. And I discussed a little bit with my kids and I said, look, we provide our food because by going to the store and we pay for our food and that's the way we provide. God isn't limited to that. He can provide food any way he wants. Unfortunately, I didn't say money that way, you know, going to work and we get money. And you'll understand that in a little bit. <clears throat> that Sunday, we come to church. Somebody walks up to me and says, hey, I got a couple bags for you. Well, that happens, you know, we leave stuff in different people's houses at times. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, just, if our name's on it, just put it on top of the coat rack, you know, we'll, we'll get it on the way out. And the person looked at me kind of funny. Like, and she said, that really won't work. 
I said, okay, look, I've got a lot of stuff going on, and I assigned it to one of my boys. You take care of whatever it is, I have no idea, okay? We get home, and I come to find out that there's a meal prepared for us that lasted more than one meal, it was actually a couple meals. That person expected it in the same way that my mother did. It was a cup of cold water. Now, I don't know what your thoughts are about looking at the meals in the wilderness, okay? Think of it, you know, the, the children of Israel obviously had the manna. They had the time when the meat was provided for them, they weren't thankful it was taken out of their mouths. But you also have Elijah by the brook, and I've heard many people talk about the type of food that was provided to him. And I'm gonna let you decide what you think it is. Is it, is it a fast food restaurant? Is it, a, was it a nice meal? Maybe you've gone to New York City and you've been able to go to some really nice steakhouse like Gallagher's. That is something that I have had the opportunity to do. That was a really nice steak, but honestly, I don't feel like those are the best steaks. The best steaks are those that we raise ourselves. We put it in the freezer and then we got it out and used it ourselves. To me, that was the best steak. I don't know where you fit in this, but I'm gonna tell you what, after that, little lesson that I had for my kids. I said, God can do whatever he wants. God has chosen to provide several meals for us. Sometimes, Tiffany is like, hey, Monty, uh, this is kind of what I got planned for dinner. What do you want to do? The phone literally rings and, said, and somebody says, hey, I've got some food for you. We had too much. And when we got too much, they actually had provided quite a bit of food, but they also provided dessert. The food was so good, we didn't get to dessert. It was like Thanksgiving, okay? <laughs> there was plenty of food there. And it was at that time that Tiffany said, I'm gonna call these things meals from the wilderness, meals in the wilderness. And I'm reminding my children with this and helping you to see, you guys have been a part of God teaching and showing my family the lesson that he has. God doesn't have to provide the way that we think he does. And sometimes those meals are really, really good. And even like last night, we had some really good tasting food and it was just enough. Sometimes it's more than enough for one meal. That's the way God chooses. So whatever Elijah had was because of whatever God chose and whatever we have, God's blessing of his choice. And I just want to remind my kids, if you don't remember that devotion, what I talked about was God can do whatever he wants. We have only a few great things that we can look at that's gone on in my lifetime that I can say, whoa, look at that amazing art. Look at that creation museum. Look at this amazing thing. This is not because somebody decided, oh, I can do this. No, it's something God lead me to do this. I can't do it. Let's allow God to take care of it. And God's promised to provide all of our needs. And he's promised to provide anything he's given to us. So I remind my family that's the way God works. He chooses to bless us and provide as he needs and he desires. And he chooses and when he calls you to do something, do it. Because he will take care of it. Thank you for those who have provided a cup of cold water for my family. And that's a blessing because we can all say, where is a cup of cold water going to be coming from with other people that we meet within this fellowship and otherwise? All right. Let's sing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me.
came to this earth as a human being, lived in a body, human, fully human, sacrificed for us, rose again, ascended to heaven. Thank you that you are there bodily and that you are with us here spiritually. Thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Apostle Paul said it this way about Jesus. When he had given thanks, he took the bread and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. Somebody else with a testimony? Feel free. You'd have to stand up. We don't have. Yes, ma'am, please. church to access other believers and let other believers have access to you. Some, I heard that someplace recently. <laughs> yes. yes. I want to hear to um, publicly thank and praise the Lord for what he did for our family. Uh, February 24th was nine years since I had a large um, tumor removed from my brain. My surgeon said it had been growing 20 to 25 years. I don't know how long it took me to get to the state I was, but it was right up here, which is your emotion. When my family found my surgeon told my family, um, it helped them to understand what was going on. I had absolutely no idea there was anything wrong with me. I could have cared less about anything. <coughs> family and most of you who were here knew that there was something wrong with me. I became quiet. I became withdrawn. And that is not who I am. <laughs> it amazes me that when that foreign object was removed from my brain, that I returned. I mean, you know, it just amazes me that people who have started coming, I think it was Sushi or have started coming during the time when I was quiet and withdrawn, and she just thought that's who I was. And when we talked to the person <laughs> returned, she found out that I wasn't the person she thought I was. But um, I'm just so thankful for what God has done. Um, God has made our bodies in such a wonderful way that over the last nine years, He's He's healed me and brought me back to be. Totally functional. I, question, but, um, I have a little numbness in the middle finger of my right hand, but I have to think about it. I had a check line put in for um, my IVs, and they hit a nerve, but that is almost gone. And after I think I have a scar underneath my hair that is a constant reminder to me of what God did. It's not something anybody else sees but it's a constant reminder to me. Um, I remember the day when I finally passed, well, my surgeon had prepared my family for a respirator, a feeding tube, if I ever talked to the employer's feet. And he let me sleep longer because of all of the, what they did to the head. I woke up on my own talking, which was the first um, sign that good things were coming. I got out of ICU earlier than I was supposed to. And I remember my son asking me about these people in ICU. I was concentrating to stay upright, that I had no idea what the people looked like. 
I moved out to the surgical floor earlier than they thought. I moved into a regular room, and then I went to in-hospital rehab, which my husband is very thankful for, because I don't know what he would have done with me. They would have brought me home. I was a mess. They gave me, March 24th was their release date for me, and they thought they were being generous. My granddaughter's birthday was on the 18th, and I thought I was going to miss it, but I worked really hard. I remember the day I passed my uh, balance test. I knew that I was coming home. Our son Sam and my husband got busy getting ladies around because I could not be home alone. And so they, ladies stayed with me. Um, three of them I came to call my angels. Um, they were with me, and they would come at 7 30 in the morning, stay to 4 30 at night, and then as I got better and could control myself, they were there as well. But they cleaned my house, they took me shopping for groceries, they took me to the doctor, and I started calling these three my angels because they gave of themselves to help us. One was Kathy Yoder, I grew up in church with her here, and we still get together once. They gave of themselves. I just sent thank you cards to them. Mr. Stephen, I am so grateful for what people did. And the cards that I got from you, I was a mess. He would bring the cards in and he'd bring them to me. I'd sit there and ball and, you know, it was just a mess. But we are so grateful for, for what God did. And that my son know that he gave me back to see uh, family. I'm so thankful our grandkids were either not born or don't remember. Taylor's our oldest, and I asked her once, and she doesn't remember. And I'm so grateful that she doesn't remember that woman that saved her life. But I end every, every year I end with, as long as God gives me breath, I will be praising him because he has done such great things for us. Let's thank the Lord for the blood that was shed for us. Lord, again, we rejoice in the truth that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. We have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. And so we partake together. We partake together remembering your death, your burial, your resurrection and thinking about the time that you will come for us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. After the same manner, he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you, you display the Lord's death till he comes. Let's partake together. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me my great salvation. So Blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. special service planned at 6.30. God bless you.